Urban legends. Scary stories that they want us to believe are true. They're not true, obviously, but urban legends are stories that want to be true. They're stories that are told as if they're true. Think like the urban legend of the Wendigo, or maybe the werewolf. Point is, the internet has a lot of these urban legends, and today we're gonna go through an iceberg that explains all of them. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them. So without further ado, go join my Discord, go follow my Instagram, and let's get straight into this. Starting with layer one, everyone talks about this. Wyoming incident. The Wyoming incident is a alleged case of TV like hijacking. Now what is TV hijacking exactly? It's when someone hijacks or hacks into a TV network and plays their own video on the TV network. For example, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the Max Headroom incident in the 80s, like that. But this one is very analog horror-y and just horrifying, right? I'll, I'll play it on screen right now. It should be on screen. Now, what's really interesting about this one, I think, is that if you Google it and just go on, like, the first thing comes up is this wiki page, right? Freakylogo.fandom.com or whatever, right? And I'm reading it, and it treats it like it's a real thing that happened. It's crazy. Like, it literally says, the Wyoming incident is a lesser-known case of television broadcast hacking. And then the whole article is talking about, like, it actually happened, but this never actually happened. This was just an urban legend. I guess that's just the reach that it had. So, what what really was it then if it never actually happened? The Wyoming incident is kind of known today as really the first internet horror ARG and creepypasta. Or at least one of the first creepypastas, but really the first ARG ever. The story behind this broadcast is that it's actually supposed to drive its viewers to madness. Like if you see it, it's supposed to drive you crazy. And according to the ARG, it resulted in mass confusion and terror. Now how did this do this exactly? Was it just spiritual? Well apparently according again to the creepypasta, it was brought upon by the the infrasonic frequencies in the hijacking, which is, I don't even know, man. So basically the story goes that some hacker hacked into a TV news station in Wyoming and played this video of these like creepy faces and stuff that actually resulted in like terrorizing and driving all of his viewers crazy. Also, fun little cool fact, one of the faces here is actually a G-Man from Gary's Mod. I think it's pretty funny. But then it doesn't stop there. Apparently this whole story is like a huge ARG. So from the original video, there's a forum called The Happy Cube, where forum goes go to share their experiences in something called cubing and I swear guys I tried to research in Google like what cubing is and I cannot find it. This ARG is huge and it originated like long 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 ago. It started in I think 2006 which was the year I was born by the way which is crazy and I know that Nightmind has a big video on it but even he apparently found the whole thing too hard to follow at some point. Like for uh, like for one time the ARG became a blog for a supernatural god who was apparently apparently responsible for the original hijacking and the video, and his reason for it was to seek to feast on the negative emotions that the video inspired in humans. This is this is like a crazy ARG. I mean, from what I'm seeing, it looks like it's kind of not that well thought out, you know? I could be wrong totally, but just from my research like 17 years later. But yeah, I mean, still insane respect for this thing, because this one like started the whole ARG online horror series thing, you know? It's really interesting. Like, this was the start that gave us things like, you know, the Mandela catalog or the monument mythos and all that kind of stuff. But moving on. Mario Party anti-piracy screens. Okay, so there are a lot of like fake anti-piracy screens in gaming over the years where people will like take a game and then make like a really like scary fake anti-piracy screen. Anti-piracy screen, by the way, for anybody that doesn't know is like, you know, piracy is like stealing stuff. So like if people torrent a game or like get an illicit illegal version of it, the console you're playing it on will know that. And then there are real screens screens like that that Nintendo puts in their games that will say like, oh no, this is a fake game, you can't play the game anymore, blah blah blah, right? But then other people like made like fake ones and meant them to be like scary, right? And some of these are pretty scary. Like this one for Mario 64, right? But the, it says, like this iceberg says Mario Party anti-piracy screens. Um, So I can only find this one Mario Party DS anti-piracy screen that was faked in like 2020, which isn't even that scary. I don't even know like what the point of this is to me personally. Like I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's like some community out there for it, right? But to me, dude, what's the point of this it's not even scary i mean i don't even think there's really much to talk about here like yeah they're behind the they're behind bars they're in, in jail oh no we're talking about more than just mario party like this one like i said the super mario 64 one is like really terrifying and this donkey kong country 3 one that i found is also really scary but there's not really much to say here it's just you know people fake these photoshop whatever premiere pro whatever they fake them be yeah, a sorry to disappoint uh, let's move on slender man guys this is hype because this is the first time i've ever went back to one of my own videos to do research dude back like a year ago like 
like maybe like like eight months ago, like last spring break for school. Dude, I took a whole week off for school right for spring break. I I, I was planning this, man. Just wait. Shawty, we went on vacation. Me and my mom did, right? And I brought my laptop to work. I got up at 4 a.m. every morning that week editing this dumb Slender Man video that I posted. And it's still like, I think my lowest viewed video on my entire channel, bro. I'm still so pissed about that, bro. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Uh, Slender Man, let's talk about Slender Man. So everyone knows Slender Man already, so I'm not gonna bore you with the stuff that you like most likely already know. So instead, I'm gonna talk about the origins of Slender Man, which is something that I don't think a lot of people actually know about. So there's this forum that was really popular back in the day on the internet called Something Awful Forum. And back in the day, years and years ago, there was a challenge on there in one of the forums, and it was to create a paranormal scary image. And every picture had to be photoshopped. And there were a lot of these that were kind of scary or whatever, but one post really stood out from the rest. It was this guy named Victor Surge who took two black and white photos of kids and photoshopped a dude in the back. A really tall, skinny dude with no face wearing a suit, who would eventually become Slender Man. I think it's really interesting too how the Slender Man mythos started. Like, listen to this. This is the exact text that came from the forum post from the first time anybody ever saw Slender Man ever. Two recovered photographs from the Sterling City Library. Notable for being taken the same day which 14 children vanished and for what is referred to as the Slender Man. Deformities cited as film defects by officials. Fire at library occurred one week later. So yes, I think it's really interesting how like the original lore was that Slender Man kidnapped 14 kids and started a fire <laughs> at a library. And also it's really cool little detail about how they thought that the, the photograph was like deformed and that's why he was so tall. That kind of detail really makes these things a lot more like interesting and believable. And then of course we all know where Slender Man went, right? We got that, that, that video game of it and then it just became super, super popular. The eight pages. And maybe you've heard of the Slender Man stabbing as well, which is really interesting. On May 31st, 2014 in Wisconsin, two 12 year old girls, Anissa Weir and Morgan Geyser, lured their friend Peyton into a forest and stabbed her 19 times. And why would they do this? They did it to appease the Slender Man. Peyton crawled to a road where she was found and recovered after six days in the hospital. Thank God, literally thank Jesus, man. Now here's the thing, the two girls were found not guilty by mental disease or defect. And instead, they were both sentenced to really, really, really long sentences in a mental institution. These kids were actually like crazy. So what was happening is they were playing hide and seek, or I'm talking too close to my I'm like, I gotta back up a little bit. So they were playing hide and seek, right? And then during this game, they went and killed Peyton, right? And then apparently their goal, like their, their game plan was to hike 200 miles to the Nicolette National Forest where the Slender Mansion is. Is that even a real place? Let me Google this. Okay, I don't think it is, <laughs> but that's what the kids said they were going to. I mean, it's crazy that mental health can be that bad to where people actually think that Slender Man not only is real, but that they can hike 200 miles and kill their friend just to appease him. Apparently the main person, like the, the cause there are two girls, right? And one of them was charged with attempted first degree murder and one was second degree murder, right? But the one that had first degree murder, apparently she was diagnosed with early onset childhood schizophrenia, which is crazy. Cause you know, schizophrenia is like when you have like these voices talking to you, right? And imagine if you're like at that age and you you hear about the Slender Man character and it just like scares the hell out of you because you're so young, right? And then boom, I mean, your mental health just is like was right there and you start imagining the Slender Man character actually talking to you. It's crazy. Anyways, that was, I mean, that was a true story. I know it's like the urban legend iceberg. The urban legend is just that Slender Man is a real person, but the true story is of the two kids and stuff. But but I've been rambling for Slender Man. I, I, I love Slender Man. I love the whole mythos of him and stuff. I think he's so cool. Um, But anyways, moving on. Polybius. So this legend goes that in 1981, when like new brands and new arcade games were really uncommon and un and un unheard of and un and unheard and unheard of, a new arcade game appeared in several suburbs of Portland, Oregon. This game was popular to the point of addiction, with lines forming around the machines and often resulting in fights over who would play next. The machines were visited by Men in Black, who would like collect data from it, allegedly testing responses to the game's like psychoactive psychological effects. And the players that played it supposedly suffered from a series of really, like, unpleasant side effects. Like seizures, amnesia, insomnia, night terrors, and hallucinations. And then also about one month later, after it, like, came out, it was just gone. The whole, the whole arcade, like, every game was just gone. Now, in most accounts of this game being a thing, like, the company that owns it is this one German word that I'm gonna try to pronounce. Zinnesloschen. Which, tr which literally translates to since delete, but it basically means sensory deprivation 
starvation. But then also, the writer named Brian Dunning says that it's not quite idiomatic German, so basically it was a word constructed outside the usual norms of German language and grammar and stuff, so kind of fake. Now what's really interesting is that Polybius is actually one of the first, like, scary things on the internet. Like, I know I said that the Wyoming incident was the first creepypasta considered by some, and that's just kind of because we don't really know what to call a creepypasta, but Polybius started in 1998. It came from a coin-op article, and this article says that there's like a ROM image file of it out there, and that who wrote the article claimed to have played it. I don't know, these ones are kind of a little difficult, you know, because of like how old they are. Like, I'm trying my best, guys, I promise, but they're kind of hard to get a good grasp on. So yeah, it's not real, but basically the whole story was just that there were like these arcade games that the government would put in there to test like MK Ultra type stuff, right? Mind control, addiction, that kind of thing. Psychological warfare, pretty much. It's pretty interesting, but no, it's not real. Guest 666. Guest 666 is an old Roblox myth and creepypasta who is rumored to have admin commands in any of the games they joined, even ones without admin built in. And whenever a player hovered over the mouse over a guest image when viewing game servers, their name used would appear as an evil guest instead of a friendly guest like normal. Now let's talk about Guest 666's personality. See, Guest 666 is an introverted, vengeful, cruel, but comprehensive spirit who only seeks to harm those who harm others. Now also, Guest 666 is even more similar to certain interpretations of the devil, as he punishes the people of malicious intent. What's really weird is that both users registered by the names of Guest 666 and Guest underscore 666 are banned. Well then, guess what guys? No reason to be scared because guess what? Guest 666 is fake! So we're actually all safe, okay? Don't even worry guys, we're all safe. Don't worry. Don't worry. Marina Mortigard Glesgor. This one is really interesting. So first, I'm just gonna read the original story in Creepypasta as it's laid out, and then I'm gonna go and explain it in the background of it. There's a video on YouTube named Marina Mortigard Glesgorv. If you search this, you will find nothing. The few times you find something, all you will see is a 20 second video of a man staring intently at you. He's expressionless, but then he grins for the last two seconds. This is only part of the actual video. The full video lasts two minutes and was removed by YouTube after 153 people who viewed the video gouged out their eyes and mailed them to YouTube's main office in San Bruno. Said people also committed suicide in various ways. The cryptic inscription that they carved on their own forearms has not yet been deciphered. The video itself was only viewed by one YouTube staff member, who started screaming after 45 seconds. This man is now under constant sedation and is apparently unable to recall what he saw. The person who uploaded the video was never found, the IP address being non-existent, and the man in the video has never been identified. Okay, now let's just talk about it. So this video was uploaded in 2008, and it had the creepypasta also posted with it. The original upload was only the 20 second long one, but then an extended 2 minute version was also uploaded later on. The video became pretty quickly viral among paranormal groups and enthusiasts, especially on 4chan, where it spawned a number of viral chain emails and articles about this guy, and they were all in several different languages. And then it really became popular once it became on the Urban Dictionary, and then from there Russia got a hold of it and it blew up on the Russian web. And in the Russian version of the creepypasta, there was an inclusion about a conspiracy theory that the video was created by the US Secret Service. And then also it came out that the video was initially made by an eBombs World user using photographs of an experienced marketing coordinator at an LA based advertising agency. And we now know the identity of the dude in the video. I'm not gonna say it for, you know, privacy or whatever, but it's out there. This one's pretty cool. I remember this one being really, really popular when I was like growing up and stuff and kind of being creepy and stuff around people my age or whatever. A little freaky. A little freaky. Just, just a little freaky. Sonic.exe. Sonic.exe is a real creepypasta. It's a story that was made to be scary. Now let's talk about it. The original Sonics.exe story centers on Tom, a young man who was a big fan of Sonic the Hedgehog, especially the older games. He claimed that he had not played any glitchy or hacked games before, though he admitted that he didn't want to after a certain experience he had. He then proceeded to recount his experience, saying how he received a CD and an accompanying letter from his friend named Kyle, begging him to destroy the disc before it's quote, too late and to not play the game. But you know, 
know it's a creepypasta, so he ignores his friend's message. He plays the game and begins to encounter odd, somewhat disturbing phenomena. From a title card featuring an evil-looking Sonic with bloody eyes and glowing pupils with a wide smile, to the presence of a file select screen similar to that of the one in Sonic the Hedgehog 3, with a red background and chilling music playing. As he picked the only available character, Tails, and began the first stage, which was called Hill Act 1, Tom continued to find more evidence that there was something wrong with the game. Namely, the copious amounts of dead animals, all murdered in gruesome ways and eventually encountering Sonic at the end of the level, standing completely still and with his eyes closed. When Tails attempted to get his attention during a cutscene by tapping him on the shoulder, Sonic's eyes opened, identical to the Sonic on the title screen before cutting to black, with the message, Hello, do you want to play with me? In the next level, Hide and Seek, Tom witnessed Sonic chasing Tails, the latter flying despite an inability to do so without a super form, before disappearing, teleporting in front of the distraught fox, and killing him and cutting to black. Shocked, Tom reads the next message, which says, You're too slow. Want to try again? After playing as Knuckles and losing a supposed boss battle with Sonic, Tom decided to take a break from the game. However, his rest was plagued by nightmares featuring the corrupted Tails and Knuckles, and the demonic Sonic, with him waking in a cold sweat. Returning to the game, Tom picked Robonick from the file select screen, and continued with the game. At the end of the level, Sonic teleported in front of Robonick before the screen cut to red static. Then a hyper-realistic image of Sonic appeared in the screen, with the words, I am God. After the game ended, Tom turned around to find, in utter horror, a bloodied Sonic plushie on his bed. Tom's fate is ambiguous, though the official sequel reveals that Tom committed suicide to escape the entity using Sonic's likeness. The sequel slash prequel of Sonic.exe centers around a young detective named Derek Green investigating the murders committed by an unknown entity. Throughout the entire murder case, each murder was investigated by Detective Derek Green and his sister Chelsea. After Chelsea got captured by EXE, Derek was dropped out of the case for unknown reasons, but that didn't stop him from pursuing his sister's captor. As he secretly investigated each murder that EXE commits, Derek slowly becomes more and more paranoid, to the point where he believes everyone is working for the cult. Through a mysterious contact named Cole, Derek discovered that the cult was behind the conspiracy and that Chelsea was trapped in EXE's world. Eventually, Derek got captured by the cult and confronted by one of the cult leaders, Shannon Goldman. Derek believed that by destroying the disc, which he did, that would once and for all stop EXE from tormenting humanity. But Shannon proved his efforts pointless and revealed that the cult made multiple copies of the game disc in case anything happened to one of them. Shannon then summoned EXE, who proceeded to steal Derek's soul. So yeah, this story is about a eldritch, crazy god being haunting Sonic. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Pets cop. Shout out to you slash J Lovecraft on Reddit for this summary that I'm about to uh, re-say to you guys. So before I get into that though, what is Petscop? Petscop is a web series on YouTube and it's presented as these like videos that this guy named Paul is uploading just to send to one of his friends. And he's just using YouTube to like share these videos with one of his friends. So here's the story behind this whole thing. Marvin lost his friend Lena when she in a windmill mysteriously vanished in 1977. Years later, Lena reincarnates as his daughter, Care. However, Care doesn't remember her past life as Lena. To help her remember, perhaps because if she remembered what happened, he would know what to do if he time-traveled back to the incident to save Lena, he commissions his nephew Rainer to make a game to help jog his daughter's memories. Rainer uses the base of a game he began a few years before, simultaneously implementing vague suggestions to make Kara remember being Lena and realizing he could use this to bring back his deceased brother Michael. And he also received support from Marvin's wife and Lena's sister, Anna. Yeah, so Marvin was, was friends with this girl named Lena and then married her her sister. <laughs> Anyways, as Marvin and Rainer experiment with the effects of the game, Rainer learns more about how obsessed Marvin has become. For a while, he doesn't do anything because he needs Marvin's support, like financially or otherwise, to revive Michael by erasing someone else's memory and implementing a AI based on Mike's recorded inputs. Except
except you can't erase someone completely so the game makes an exchange. It keeps the original person as a character when it puts the AI into their body. Rainer combined the two ideas into one in an effort to revive another dead family member, Tiara, but something goes wrong partially because the game doesn't have any data from Tiara's that could be put together to make her AI. Now because of this, Bell, whom he was trying to make into Tiara, gets copied into the game but also remains in her body. Bell in the game, who I'll refer to as Tiara, remembers this, but in real life, Bell doesn't. Rainer ignores Marvin's increasingly worrisome behavior until something goes wrong and Kara is put in the opposite state from Bell. Her original memories and personality are neither in the real world nor her body. Kara, or the person who used to be Kara, becomes Paul. Rainer betrays Marvin by trapping him in the very game he urged Rainer to make, now a living monument to everything awful Marvin did and a living hell. Now years later, Anna's machinations come into play when Paul finds Petscop. She intends to use the game the same way Marvin did, to revive the Lena part of Paul slash care, but when he doesn't want to keep playing, his mother prevents him from doing so. And when it comes time, Paul messes it up and doesn't become care or Lena. And now either Anna's frustration and anger or Paul's newly reactivated trauma sends out a ripple throughout space-time, which travels back to 1977 and teleports both a windmill and a nine-year-old girl into outer space, killing them both instantly. This, this, this story is crazy how, like, in-depth it is, man. But it's creepy. This is, like, well put together, I think. SCP Foundation. So you guys know, like, Kane Pixel's version of the backrooms, like, this new thing with the backrooms, about this, like, weird company, like, trying to contain it and, like, go into it and discover it whenever? That's basically what the SCP Foundation is, but for Skibbity Toilet Kids. So the SCP Foundation became a thing back in 2008, and it stands for Secure, Contain, Protect, or Special Containment Procedures. Either one. So it's a really diverse and well-funded paranormal organization, and what they do is they apprehend and contain anomalies, or what they call them, or SCPs, basically. Ranging from creatures, to objects, to locations, to events, to phenomena, and again, these are all called SCPs. And even though they're portrayed as having, like, really good intentions for what they do, sometimes they kind of do some morally gray stuff. Now, like I said, it started in 2008 officially because that's when the SCP website started, but just like most creepypastas, the SCP story was spreading all around the internet before that as well, and it's not really exactly known how it started. But we do know one of the SCPs that really made it popular, this was SCP-173, also known as the Sculpture. This thing's also known as the Evil Doer, or the Killer Statue, and a lot of different names. It's basically a statue that can move really fast and can snap the neck of any life form. And apparently, according to one source, it was the first SCP ever written. Um, I'm not sure how much salt to take with that, it could totally be wrong, but that's what this one is saying. And also, this guy is a great segue to talk about the video games that are also about SCP. There are a lot of them, but the most famous one is called SCP Containment Breach. And this evil doer statue guy, SCP-173, is the main antagonist of that game. The SCP stuff is really, really cool. It's kind of hard to get into, at least it is for me, because of how, like, I don't know, maybe it's like my Gen Z brain is not able to enjoy anything that's not, like, super, you know, like, in your face and, like, stimulating or whatever, but to me, it was kind of hard to get into and, like, kind of enjoy. Like, I played the game a little bit, like, I tried a long time ago on Steam. I just couldn't really get into it. Basically, like, in the games, you're in the SCP Foundation, like, facility and you're just trying to like, you know, it's like a horror game, you're trying to just like escape or whatever, and complete tasks while you're being chased by these SCPs. Anyways though, on the wiki there are now over 6,000 entities and articles, and it's constantly being made, and like there's new things constantly being added and stuff. This is like a very active community still, like how many years later? 15 years later, yeah, dang. Alright, and that is the first layer over, guys. So we're moving from everyone talks about this to mostly known. And we're starting out this layer with one time times one times one times one. One times one times one times one is a test Roblox account that was made by Shettleski, who was one of the first ever Roblox players and he was the fourth admin engineer ever hired by Roblox. And so this urban legend is a character account that he made to test things on as an actual admin and developer for the game, but people would see it and they started claiming that he was a hacker. This one by one by one by one account. And also, fun fact, this is the only Roblox myth that has ever become like an official thing. There's like an official toy made for one times one times one times one. Now guys, again, this thing started in 2007 and I'm not like the most knowledgeable on Roblox. So if I get any details wrong, I'm sorry. I'm just going to go off what the wiki is saying and some other resources too. So apparently Shettleski actually 
invented this whole story as like a, a, a origin story for the game in some way. So basically where it started is I'm, I'm going to read directly from a forum post by Mr. Doombringer, who is another former administrator of Roblox. Long ago, Telemann, which by the way is the old name of the Shadowski guy that made it, like it's the same guy, Tel Telemann and Shadowski is the same guy. Telemann posted a number of stories about Roblox's backstory to the news. One of these included mentions of 2x2, the first brick, copied over and over again every other brick were its descendants. Then in a footnote, he mentions the evil one by one by one by one, so that's where the name comes from. But the urban legend is that people think this account is like a hacker and like some evil spirit or something, but it's just not. <laughs> cursed Kleenex Commercial The Cursed Kleenex Commercial is an urban legend of a real Japanese Kleenex commercial released in the late 80s that is said to be cursed. People who have seen it claim to feel terrified and depressed as well as experience strange phenomena around them. The commercial seemingly takes place in a reddish landscape as two characters are seen sitting on hay. One is a weird demonic looking baby with green afro hair and a young woman in a white robe. The video shows the young woman taking out the Kleenex wipes and wiping the demonic emotionless baby as well as kissing it before throwing the wipes into the air as the Kleenex logo appears. An eerie version of an old English pop song called It's a Fine Day plays in the background throughout but it's often misinterpreted as a German curse. When the commercial was released to the public in the late 80s, many people complained to have it taken down as they reported to feel disturbed and uneased. Other reports claim that when watching it at night, primarily at the stroke of midnight, the commercial will become distorted in a terrifying way. It was rumored that many people either committed suicide or died mysteriously after viewing the commercial at midnight, and it's also rumored that the actress Kaiko Matsuzaka, who played the woman in white, became impregnated by a demon and was sent to a mental asylum after a breakdown. Which is... <laughs> dude. The baby who portrayed the demon baby is also rumored to have been decapitated in a car crash while the cameraman who shot the commercial burned to death in a sauna bath. However, these rumors are proven false and no one in the commercial was actually harmed. However, the legend of this commercial still lives on to this day and is said to be an actual curse. The commercial once again reached the public eye after it was uploaded to YouTube in the mid-2000s. Many people have sworn that the video changes and distorts before crashing when people watch it at midnight. The original video has been taken down, but copies of the video can still be found on the internet, as well as alleged proof and evidence of the video changing at midnight. But, I mean, you know, it's just an urban legend, buddy. Suicidemouse.avi This is a black and white cartoon featuring a looped animation of the Disney character Mickey Mouse walking along with several buildings accompanied by eerie piano music. The video cuts to black after several minutes and returns with distorted video and loud screaming audio at the end. The video is uploaded by a YouTuber named Neck1 on November 25th, 2009, and it came with a long story about, like, a fake backstory about the animation. The description gives out information and other details about the animation. And honestly, this one's kind of well written. I read most of it. It's pretty well written. It starts with the question, so do any of you remember those Mickey Mouse cartoons from the 1930s? It's pretty creepy. The video starts with Mickey walking with a morose expression, however with no soundtrack. But soon things begin to change, sounds start to play in the background, it begins with a rhythmic tapping, and then what the source describes as a murmur. It wasn't a language, but more of a gurgled cry. Now as the volume and intensity of this quote murmur increases gradually, the background begins to shift in surreal and irrational ways, bending and twisting into a nightmare landscape, and then Mickey's expression begins to morph into an obscene sneer. By the seventh minute, the gurgled cry becomes an anguished scream, and Mickey Mickey's face continues to warp into a rictus of horror, his eyes and mouth enlarging, while buildings around him begin to crumble. By the eighth minute of the footage, Mickey is running frantically, and his face looks just so, like, cursed and awful. All the while, the screaming reaches a painful pitch. The reel then cuts to the large, smiling Mickey logo typically shown at the beginning and end of Disney's vintage One Reel cartoons. So on December 8th, 2009, a duplicate of this video was uploaded by a YouTuber named Suicide Mouse AVI. And this is the most popular copy with over a million views. Also, it's kind of funny, there is a Gary's mod, like, mod of it. This one YouTuber named Kitty0706 uploaded a video called The G Mod Suicide Mouse Survival Guide. This one kind of took off, though. The following day, a thread was submitted to the Snopes forum, accompanied by the copy poster from the video's description. A Yahoo's answer question about the video's authenticity was posted on February 28th, 2011. And then the first Urban Dictionary entry was submitted on June 20th, 2011. This one's like pretty, pretty widespread, I would say. But this video, of course,
chorus is also supposed to be cursed or whatever. Apparently it's supposed to be a, a cover up of a Disney death or something. I don't even know, man. Squidward's sewer slide. This one is also known as Red Mist. So you know the creepypasta trend about like, oh, this is a lost episode of an old TV show. This is like one of the first ones. This, was, this one kind of popularized that. So this one was about a lost episode of SpongeBob from season four. So this original creepypasta was posted from an anonymous user from 7chan's Paranormal Board. The user describes how while being an intern for Nickelodeon, he and a few other people requested to watch a copy of the episode Fear of the Krabby Patty. Instead, the title read Squidward Sue Suicide. But thinking of the episode being some morbid joke shared by the animators, they decided to continue with the task at hand. The episode begins with the title card of Squidward's suicide before the camera pans into Squidward playing his clarinet horribly. He's soon interrupted by SpongeBob and Patrick laughing outside. Squidward aggressively tells them both to quiet down as he's practicing for a concert, which sadly goes wrong for him. However, as the crowd booed him for his horrendous performance, they all seem to have red eyes, similar to that of fish in in fish, including. SpongeBob and Patrick himself, like real life fish. The camera then cuts to Squidward, upset and embarrassed in his bedroom, sobbing with his head on his knees. But the crying didn't sound like Squidward, it sounded like an actual, genuine, real person. The scene continues for a while until Squidward reveals his face to the camera. And now Squidward has the same eyes as the crowd with blood dripping down, while the crying increases in volume in the background. Once the crying stops, a deep voice off screen shouts, Do it! as the camera pans out to show Squidward holding a shotgun in his mouth. Seconds later, he shoots himself and the camera pans out once more to present his remains on screen before the episode ends. The true creator of this was never actually identified, and there have been numerous attempts to find this episode, but all have proven to be in vain. Because it's not real. It's just some guy telling a story to, 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 to scare you, you know, to, to get you all scary. He's just trying to be scary. Also, apparently, towards the end of the episode, there were, like, images of, like, I don't even want to say it, like, CP murder type stuff, if you know what I mean? According to the story or whatever, but I don't know, you know, it's, it's just all fake. But people believe this one. This one is really, 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 like, powerful and influential too. Also, Squidward's Suicide was written in 2009, and remember how I said that it influenced a lot of other stories? That brings us to our next entry, Dead Bart. This one was written in 2010, a year later, and this is another lost episode creepypasta. So this is another creepypasta, you know, written, and I'll just go and explain that. The author begins the story talking talking about how Fox has a weird way of counting Simpsons episodes, making them inconsistent. The author would begin to go into detail on how strange Matt Groening would act during the production of the first season of the show, and how mentioning this to anyone who works in The Simpsons results in them getting very angry, and forbidding you to ever mention it to Matt. And then the author explains how they, like, knew about the episode, and apparently they said that they were at an event where David Silverman was speaking, and someone in the crowd asked about the episode, and Silverman simply left the stage like out of nowhere. The story would move on to the author at a fan event and how he was able to get the episode. The author managed to follow Matt after he spoke to the crowd and eventually had a chance to talk to him alone as he was leaving the building. He didn't seem upset that the author had followed him as he was expecting a typical encounter with an obsessive fan, but when the author mentioned the lost episode, all color drained from his face and he started trembling. At this point, apparently Matt grabbed a piece of paper and wrote down the website address for the episode. When the author got home and started downloading it, he experienced a really bad computer virus that ended up forcing him to reboot the computer. When the author started the episode, nothing seemed out of the ordinary besides the poor animation. When the intro ended and the actual episode started, everyone acted differently from their usual, like, original characters. Homer was more angry, Marge was depressed, Lisa was more anxious, and Bart had genuine hatred for his family. The family was getting on a plane that was going somewhere unknown, and Bart, being himself, was goofing around the plane until he eventually broke a window on accident and he got sucked out. When Bart hits the ground, his body was so realistic that you couldn't tell it was Bart. Then it cuts to the family back at home, sitting at the kitchen table crying, but the crying was more realistic and pain-filled. I, I wonder where they got that idea from. This went on for two whole acts. The second act of them crying took place two years later after Bart's death. The family was still at the kitchen table and there was no sight of Maggie and the pets. Shortly after, the family goes to visit Bart's gravesite, and when they got there, they discovered that his carcass wasn't buried but was lying in front 
front of his own gravestone instead, still looking the same as when it fell out of the plane. The family starts crying again, but they eventually stop and just stare at Bart's body. Homer tells a joke at this point, but from how bad the quality is, you can't even hear what he said. The camera zooms out to show tombstones of every guest star the Simpsons would ever have. But for all the guest stars who had already died, their death dates were correct. But for the ones that hadn't died yet, their death dates were all listed on the exact same date. Now, this story was originally written by the game FAQ's user K.L. Simpson, and it was published in, guess what, a Suicide Mouse thread on January 19th, 2010. Now, after the creepypasta was posted, several YouTube videos were posted as recreations of the story, with some listed as, quote, evidence. For example, on December 2nd, 2012, a recreation of the creepypasta was posted, gaining over 62,000 views. The story is listed on the creepypasta wiki and a few other websites, and has been covered by several media outlets as a hoax. And as Mashable dubbed it, an absurd fan theory. Explainers for the creepypasta have also been posted to YouTube, like videos like uh, the one I'm making right now. Like even Scare Theater covered it. Marble Hornets. Marble Hornets was the first web series to cover Slenderman, and it's still probably the most famous one to be like a web series that's about Slenderman. Or as he's known in this series, The Operator. Marble Hornets gets its name from Alex Crawley's film project, Marble Hornets. The early entries in this series are clips from the filming tapes used in creating this film project. Alex ended the project early due to being stalked by the operator, and then he decided to hand over the tapes he had so far to his friend and the narrator of the series, Jay. Alex told Jay that he planned to burn the tapes, but being a good friend, Jay was given the tapes and posted them on YouTube in hopes others could possibly help him understand what was so distressing about the tapes. Alex transferred to a different school shortly after, and Jay hadn't seen him since. That's the setup for the series. Now, early entries consisted of tapes from the film project Marble Hornets and were taken by Alex, who obsessively recorded himself in order to capture the operator stalking him. Remember, the operator is Slenderman, pretty much. Eventually, the entries turned to videos taken by Jay, cataloging his efforts to discover Alex's whereabouts and unravel the mystery around the operator. Over time, Jay follows leads to old buildings, former homes, and even defunct and abandoned locations. And he begins finding that this being stalking his old friend may be deeper and even more dangerous than he ever thought. And there's a good chance Jay may now be hunted for getting too involved. Now, Marble Hornets being the first Slenderman ARG set several trends that were like emulated for other future ARGs. So this one was very influential for other ARGs like Tribe 12, Everyman Hybrid, ML Anderson Zero, all like etc, etc. Yeah, I love this series. Marble Hornets is crazy. I love Slenderman. I made a whole video on it. That video sucks, so you don't gotta go watch it. I sound like a baby in that video. Even though it was only like half a year ago, I just didn't know how to mix my audio, so I sounded so bad. But um, yeah, let's, let's move on. So with that, we go from the mostly known lair to the known lair. Smile Dog. Smile Dog, also known as Smile.jpg, is a supposedly haunted image dating back to the beginnings of the internet. Smile.jpg has a reputation for driving those who view it insane, making its victims view it in their mind's eye at every turn. While it has been discovered that these images in victims' minds are the result of epileptic seizures, there is no clear understanding of why the image causes this. All the victims who spoke up about their experiences, however, have said they are also visited by the dog-like creature in the image, named Smile Dog. When in these dreams, the only thing the victims can do is watch and listen as Smile Dog tells them the only respite to their torment is to, quote, spread the word. And many of them receive shortly thereafter a removable media via mail without a return address. Inside it is said to be another copy or form of Smile Dog, which the victim is supposed to spread to others like they're told. Those who claim to have seen Smile.jpg often joke that they were far too busy to save a copy of the picture to their hard drive. However, all alleged victims offer the same description of the photo. A dog-like creature, usually describing it as appearing similar to a Siberian husky, illuminated by the flash of a camera, sits in a dim room. The only background detail that is visible being a human hand extending from the darkness near the left side of the frame. The hand is empty, but is usually described as beckoning. Of course, most attention is given to the dog, or dog creature, as some victims are more certain than others about what they have claimed to see. The muzzle of the dog is reputedly split in a wide grin, revealing two rows of very white, straight, and sharp teeth. This is, of course, not a description given immediately after viewing the picture, but rather a recollection of the victims, who claim to have seen the picture endlessly repeated in their mind's eye during the time they are, in reality, having epileptic fits. These fits are reported to continue always, often while the victims sleep, resulting in very vivid and disturbing nightmares. Okay, and that is just, you know, according to the creepypasta, but it's obviously not real. 
Bible. Spoutdog was created by a guy named Michael Lutz, or Warren's Dead is his like online name. The exact origin of the smile.jpg creepypasta is unknown, but is rumored to have been first posted on the paranormal board on 4chan in 2008. Also, the image shared with it is pretty popular too. Oh, by the way, when I say the exact origin of the creepypasta is unknown, I mean, like, the image, not the, uh, like, because we know who made it. It was Michael Lodge, like I said. 1995 build of Super Mario. Okay, so this is another creepypasta. This one's about a uh, scary game. An anonymous user wrote of their experience talking to a foreign friend from Japan back in 1995. Their friend used to work at Nintendo, and he remarks of his time working there and working on the very first build of Super Mario. 64. This former programmer and his team were handed the prototype after Nintendo bought it from another Japanese company. The team was tasked with cleaning up the prototype for the Ultra 64, which was the original name of the Nintendo 64. The programmer explains how this build bore no resemblance to the happy-go-lucky Mario franchise, and instead was rather a desolate build. He doesn't recall the appearance of the player character, but refers to them as looking instead simplistic like a low-poly ordinary man. He goes on to discuss the castle itself. Unlike the retail release, the castle was made into one full map, meaning that all the castle is smaller to fit into the exterior of the castle. Remnants of this are seen within the demos of the game seen within the game shows, where the rooms with paintings are a lot smaller than they are in the release of the game. The programmer goes into great detail in the basement. The basement was a lot darker in this build and had rather advanced fog for Nintendo 64 standards. According to the programmer, the basement acted as a testing ground for an experimental artificial intelligence that would track the player's cognitive desires and subvert them. With this, the basement would usually span endlessly like a labyrinth. One playtester whom the team neglected to check on before leaving the office for the night was still playing the game in a delirious and crazed state. He was taken to the hospital shortly after being found, and later, playtesters were urged not to enter the basement. When asked about the upper floors, the programmer said there wasn't much interesting up there. It was a boring and thin spiral staircase that led up to what seems to be a bedroom. He was surprised to hear about a supposed fourth floor, and says that considering Nintendo made the castle big with its use of sub areas, it wouldn't be surprising that they would try to add yet another floor. So, yeah, this is like a really, like, classic, I guess, creepypasta in this style. Now, this one I really can't find much info on. Like, I don't even really know when it started. I just know that I've heard of it before. Um, I am sorry about that, guys. I really, I really can't find exactly how this creepypasta even started. But it, it's, it's definitely one of those, like, classic ones, I feel like, you know? Abandoned by Disney. This is another creepy pasta story. You know, this one, I'm actually really, like, happy to be covering this one now because I am so tired of all the cursed video game creepypasta. Like, I don't know if that's just me, but those, dude, oh my gosh, I'm, there's so many of them, bro. Okay. Anyways, anyways, shoddy. Abandoned by Disney has a lot of prequels and sequels as well, but it's one of the most, like, popular creepypastas out there. It was written by Slime Beast. So the first story starts with the narrator describing the abandoned Treasure Island Resort that Disney built in the Bahamas, and how reading an explorer's blog about the place inspired him to go visit another abandoned Disney resort near his community called Mowgli's Palace. Once he actually gets to the place, place, though, things kind of start going downhill. So before we get into that, though, let me give a little bit more background on Mowgli's Palace. So in the universe of this creepypasta, there was a 1990 Jungle Book-themed park from Disney, and Mowgli's Palace was a project from that park. And then when it came time for the whole Jungle Book-themed park to open, everything was ready and fully operational except for the palace. Everything was pretty normal and good. The park was populated with visitors and staff until one day, out of the blue, the whole place was shut down. The staff were all dismissed and the doors were chained up. Apparently this place was supposed to be in on Emerald Isle in North Carolina, so represent North Carolina. Hell yeah. Anyways, he travels to the park after finding its location on a promotional flyer that was mailed to him before opening. Now when he got there, he noticed that everything was kind of decaying and like returning to nature, but he also claims that he can hear creepy voices coming from inside. Now also, everywhere on every surface was scrawled the phrase, quote, abandoned by Disney. So now Wolf's journey took him deeper into the depths of this Mowgli's palace place, and eventually into a room full of empty freezers and swinging meat hooks. And this is where he starts to hear the phrases, your father told you, and I didn't know that, I didn't know that. Now he eventually found the room character prep number one, and among a collection of Disney mascot costumes, he saw a rotten version of Mickey that looked like a camera negative. He then goes to pick up a Donald Duckhead, only to 
have a skull, yeah, like a real human skull, tumble from inside. But then here's where it uh, gets bad. <laughs> the negative Mickey gets up and starts like walking towards him. And now I'm gonna read a little quote directly from the story for what happened next. Hey, it said in a hushed, perverted, but perfectly executed Mickey Mouse voice. Wanna see my head come off? It started to pull at its own head, working its clumsy, glove-clad fingers around its neck with clawing, impatient movements similar to a wounded man trying to pull himself free of a predator's jaws. As it worked its digits into its neck, so much blood. So much thick, chunky, yellow blood. And yeah, that's the story. Pretty cool, right? No, but actually, that's pretty much the main story of the first story, but then again, there are other uh, sequels and prequels and stuff. There are three other ones. So, a few suggestions is a semi-comedic collection of suggestion cards from employees at Mowgli's palace before it was abandoned, and hints vaguely at what may have happened to the place. Room Zero deals with the fallout in the narrator's life from the original events and describes the other unsavory stories he's uncovered from the Disney Corporation in his investigations since. And in the final installment, Corruptus follows the truth behind the mysteries and the true reasoning behind the existence of the hauntings. Now, I'm no creepypasta connoisseur, but I am a fan of Five Nights at Freddy's, so in my eyes, the best thing that ever came from this is the uh, FNAF-inspired game Five Nights at Treasure Island, which is like a fan game that that was inspired by this story, so that's a W. NES Godzilla Creepypasta. Oh my god, remember what I said about these dumb freaking haunted- Oh my god, I hate these so much. Sorry, sorry, I don't cuss, but- ah. So this creepypasta is a creepypasta about a corrupted, horror-cursed version of NES Godzilla. The story follows a guy named Zack who gets his hand in a cartridge of the 1988 game Godzilla Monster of Monsters for the NES. And then after starting the game for the first time, the nostalgia floods him crazily, but the excitement wore off quickly as the game is basically a badly developed mess. So the game kind of sucks. Except that it was until he battled Gezora for the first time. When he's backed in a corner, the game starts to glitch and the battle timer doesn't stop from keeping Godzilla trapped. So the timer just lasted over five minutes. And then this forces Zack to take out the cartridge, blow it, and start over. And then he defeated Gezora and Mogiwara, I don't even know how to pronounce these names, dude, pretty easily after he reached them. But then he noticed something was wrong after he reached Mars. Varen had been replaced by Titanosaurus, a monster who was not in the original game. Now thinking he was playing some kind of prototype, he got excited and battled his way up to a rematch with Gezora. But then that ended in another glitchy note. Now he knew something was wrong with the game, but foolishly he kind of ignored those feelings for Megora, the other boss, who had grown to twice its original size. And then after he defeated it, Megora's sprite shattered into pieces. And now he was worried about the same glitch happening to Titanosaurus, but to his relief, the fight went well. But then guess what? After the after after the next world, he gets stalked by something within the game. Something that will leave him traumatized for the rest of his life. Dude, this creepypasta has so much lore to it. There are like eight parts to it. I think there are eight chapters to this creepypasta. And uh, okay, guys, I, I love you guys, obviously, right? But um, I'm in school, you know, and I have like a life. There's no shot I'm reading this whole thing, <laughs> this whole thing for this video. Um, there's a there's a whole reading online of the whole thing, so you can go and like there are multiple actually. Some ordinary gamers apparently did a whole reading of this thing. Um, so maybe I should listen to it because this is kind of cool actually. But yeah, it's it's a cursed version of Godzilla game. Kill Switch. Kill Switch is really similar to Polybius in that the urban legend is about whether or not the game exists at all rather than anything specific about it. Now this game, Kill Switch, was supposedly developed by a Czechoslovakian company called Carvina Corporation, and only 5,000 copies were ever released. According to the legend, the game was unique in that it could only ever be played once. When the player died, the game erased itself from their system, making it completely unplayable. The game has two different characters to play as, although only one scenario can ever be completed on one version of the game due to the aforementioned thing I just talked about. Now, as it turns out, Kill Switch isn't real. Surprise, surprise. It originated as a short story published in The Melancholy of Mecha Girl, a collection of stories and poems by author Catherine M. Valente, which is pretty cool. I mean, it's pretty cool that an actual writer made this, you know? And these kind of urban legends are really cool to me, like Polybius and stuff. I think that I think those are all really scary. Well, not scary, but just like really interesting and like well thought out.
out, you know? So here's some more details about the game from the story. Apparently it has a time limit to it. Once you've started, you only have exactly a week to complete it, or, or 168 hours. And then if you don't complete it in the time, the game also deletes itself then too. And no one knows how the game was created. Now in the game, like I said, you could play as two characters, right? But you could never actually play as both. So the one character is named Gast, and he could attack, but the other character named Porto could not attack. And it's assumed that Porto's gameplay was akin to a point and click puzzle game, but Gast was more combat related. This is pretty cool. I mean, this is, I like this one. Ash's Coma Theory. This theory says that the main character of Pokemon, the series, Ash Ketchum, is actually in a coma. See, in the first episode, Ash falls off his bike, and it's only after then does he ever actually start seeing Pokemon. So the theory is that he fell into a coma, and then the whole series is just a big dream, and that's why Pokemon exist. They're not real, they're just a dream. Now, I can't really find who came up with this or where it came from. I've been looking, looking for it for a while, but it's pretty old, I guess, because, I mean, the series is, like, old as hell. So I think this theory is, like, pretty old and it, pretty, I mean, I, I've heard of this before. It's pretty popular, I think. Red Rooms. Now, I have, I think, actually, like, two whole videos on just Red Rooms. I think, I don't have one, at least, and I have a video about the Dark Web. Um, so you can go check out that video if you want to learn more about Red Rooms, uh, but I'll just kind of briefly explain them here. So Red Rooms are the idea that on the deep web, dark web, whatever you want to call it, there are live streams, right, that are scary. And when I say scary, I mean even scarier than those hot tub streamers you caught your little brother watching last week. This urban legend is that there are live streams of these actual red rooms where it's like the walls are red, red light, blood, whatever, of people being kidnapped, tortured, and killed. And the theory goes further that if you're in one of these live stream chats, you can pay real money to the people who kidnap these people and tell them what to do to them, like how to torture them. And then if you spend enough money, you can tell them how to kill the person. All right, I'm gonna leave it there, but I mean, these are obviously fake. Or are they? Blind Maiden website. There's a website that offers its users the choice to experience the, quote, ultimate horror. This website called blindmaiden.com is supposedly a site dedicated to a doomed spirit that will enter the home of people who have viewed it. However, no matter how hard you try, your browser won't allow you to enter the site. You see, to enter the site, you must wait until exactly 12 a.m., making sure that the night in question is a new moon night. You must be on your own in your home with the lights turned off. Only when these conditions are met will you be granted access to the site. As soon as you enter, you will see a montage of pictures being displayed quickly. These images are of boys and girls without eyes and faces that are twisted in tremendous fear. After that, text will appear on the monitor saying, this website will take you to a whole new level of horror, a horror that will use all five of your senses. You must be very careful not to click on anything by accident. You will be faced with a real experience of absolute horror. Click the accept button to engage actively in this experience, and then it'll have an accept button and a decline button. If you click decline, you will be rewarded with access to the entire archive of these gruesome images, a gore site pretty much. Click accept, however, and there will be no turning back. You have sealed your fate, and trust me, you will experience the ultimate horror. Upon accepting, you will see a sinister silhouette walking towards your home on your monitor. The spirit will then approach and enter the same room as you are in. You will then see your own back on the monitor, and you will feel a presence behind you. Suddenly, you will feel someone tapping on your shoulder, and as you turn around, you will see the blind maiden's face and scream in terror. And that will be the last thing you will do, as she will then kill you. The blind maiden will then plug your eyes out and take a photo of your face. Congratulations, you have successfully completed the ritual, and as a reward, that photo will forever be a part of the website's picture gallery. Just like all the other photos of people who were stupid or curious enough to press the accept button. And yes, if you are a thrill seeker, then you will love the last few moments of your life. I mean, what's the deal with airline food, do you feel me? <laughs> I mean, what are you supposed to do, eat the airplane? <laughs> Catastrophe Crow slash Crow 64. Oh my god, this is another stupid, stupid, cursed, creepy 
creepypasta about a stupid cursed video game. Holy f oh my god, bro. Catastrophe Crow is a forgotten Nintendo 64 game, according to a certain creepypasta. Now this is another really big one that would take me probably like a week to research, um, but I'll give a bit of a background for you guys. On October 15th, 2020, YouTuber Adam Butcher posted a video titled, What Happened to Crow 64, in which he described the troubled development of a supposedly lost N64 3D platformer called Catastrophe Crow. In Butcher's tale, the game was developed by Manfred Lorenz of Opus Interactive, and the game had some hype prior to its release date, but it never came out as Lorenz became obsessed over the game and brought the studio deeper into debt, eventually locking himself in the studio for months and letting go of all the development staff. Eventually, the Nintendo GameCube was released, and Lorenz disappeared with all the development materials, possibly curling himself by jumping off a boat in the North Sea. Butcher then begins a let's play of a development copy he's found. The game plays over little commentary as the main crow character encounters increasingly disturbing scenarios, and all these scenarios appear to allude to Lawrence's death. Now this has so much more lore, like there was another video which was the end credit song to another fake game that this YouTuber made up for the ARG, and then also Butcher made up like a whole language called the Crow language where he, he like put these like messages, these hidden messages in the video and stuff. It's a whole huge thing, I mean this is something like research for sure if you want. There's a whole game theory video on it too, uh, watch that, I mean game theory's awesome bro. RIP MatPat, RIP man, I didn't want to see you go like that, but. And with that we are moving from from known lair to kind of known lair. Normal stuff for normal people. Um, there's a not safe for work warning in this one, I guess. Skip to this timestamp if you don't want to hear about this stuff. So this is a creepypasta about a website called normal PORN for normal people.com. The person telling the creepypasta, the narrator, discovers the site not by searching for it or finding it, but through a chain email. And when he goes on the site, it appears to be very poorly designed and features a nonsensical rant, with each word being a hyperlink to different pages containing a long list of links. And the narrator, driven by curiosity, clicks on these links, which lead to various videos, one of them being the most famous, and we'll talk about that one last, but these videos range from mundane to bizarre and unsettling, and here are the ones that he mentions. Or she, I don't know, there's no gender given. Peanut.avi. This is a 30 minute video showing a woman making a peanut butter sandwich for a dog. Ah. Lickedclean.avi. This is a video of a man licking a washing machine. Jimbo.avi. This is a video of the dude Jimbo from YouTube talking about uh, taking a zip tie to two Bud Light cans to make a bra. No, no, I'm kidding. This is actually footage of an obese mime ending with him sobbing. Then we have Diana.avi, which is of a woman playing violin with a disturbing background activity. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a fat man in a chicken mask. Uh, nasty. <laughs> then we have tongue-tie.avi, which is of an elderly woman making out with a mannequin. Stumps.avi, which is about a legless man forced to dance until he's exhausted. <laughs> then we have privacy.avi, which features individuals from previous videos in bizarre and suggestive acts. Like for example, the woman from Diana.avi is and the man from Stumps to AVI walks around in his hands and he's wearing like a goblin mask. And there's some other stuff too. You like see the animals. There's a whole bunch of animals, by the way, in all of these. And now we have the eighth and most famous one, the, the popular one, which is useless.avi, where there's a woman who is tied down to a mattress and a chimpanzee starts mauling her. Now the narrator of the story shares these findings on an image board, which sparks widespread interest and discussion. But then the thread is deleted and the narrator is banned when he tries to recreate it. The website itself is taken down shortly after the discovery of useless.avi, presumably due to legal intervention. Next we have Keto Gata commercial. This one's really scary. I remember I, I was in a VC with my with my editor and I showed her this. <laughs> she was like, she was screaming. She was like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Shout out my editor, bro. Um, this is her, this is, this is her thing. Go follow her. By the way, come join my discord if you want to hang out.
out with me in VCs and stuff. Because I'm always doing that because, you know, for fun or whatever. Anyways, this is an urban legend dating back to 2004 on the anonymous Japanese message board website 2CH. Users believe that this piece of media, the Hito Gata commercial, is a PSA shown in schools or it could be a commercial that aired late at night. Testimonies and eyewitness accounts vary, but the general premise stays the same. This is what the video was. The sound of a railroad crossing sign in the background as two white, featureless human figures appear on the screen. When one figure fades out, another fades in. Text is displayed on the screen, with some reports of a narrator saying that every two seconds someone dies on Earth, although the time varies between eyewitness accounts of like how long. Originally in 2004, numerous recreation videos have been made depicting these two white, featureless figures. Despite numerous search efforts, the commercial has not been found and still remains an urban legend, and as far as I know, this one has not even been disproven. This one is awesome, I love this one, it's so interesting, it's so creepy, it's so weird, it's so just, I don't even know man, I love this one. And I love how it totally could be real, like there's no proof that we have that it's not real. And also, I did a little bit of research and I found this Reddit thread that links to a video that actually could be the real Hito Gata commercial. It's not known for sure because it's not exact, but it, it, it totally could be. I mean, this one's really interesting. I like this one. Because it's not even like really supposed to be scary. It's just like, you know, Agamemnon counterpart. This is an ARG about, or like a creepypasta about a, a cartoon that's supposed to have aired in the year 2571. This one, I don't know, it's kind of, it's kind of cool. It's it's, it's kind of scary. I mean, it's about like there's a cassette tape that was found, but then it says that immediately after like, oh, but what you're about to watch was not in the cassette tape, so it's kind of, I don't know, boring, whatever. The story is that somebody in like 2003 found this footage that's supposed to be taking place or like have been filmed in 2500, like in the future. Um, but yeah, it, it is kind of creepy looking. I am God. This is when I had a fun time researching. So this is all about a, a 4chan mystery that ended up being a huge <laughs> troll. Right. So this guy on 4chan was telling everybody on 4chan, he was saying OP, I'm gonna call him OP, which means original poster. OP was saying like, my friend had a computer virus and now his computer keeps getting all these strange cursed files. And he kept getting these files from his friend, like he asked his friend to send him some because people in the thread were asking him for them. And he sent one and it kind of looked weird, people didn't know what it was, got another one, and then people realized that it was these like slides to a face. And then eventually he even recorded a video video in the house, or he got a video from his friend of the house where it was, like where the computer virus was, and there was like a red face that kind of looked like the face they were building in the video, it was like a spooky thing. So then his friend came over, slept with him, the two men slept together at his house, at the non-haunted house, and then OP kept getting sent more pictures and showing pictures, and then in one of them there was some kind of like binary code that they had to unravel, and it was this whole thing, you'd like translate it to Welsh, it was a whole, you know how those ARGs are, where you get like a secret message or a little hidden clue in a picture, and it, it translated to I am God, right? And then eventually, once he got enough pictures to finish the puzzle, it was a picture of Nostalgia Critic. <laughs> It is kind of scary. Ah! 7 25 2005 or July 25th 2005. This one's pretty pretty interesting. So this is a creepypasta about a story about how during one of the airings of a Spongebob episode there was a strange glitch where Spongebob started like glitch out and morph. And there's been a recreation of this um, on YouTube. Uh, editor thank you so much for putting it in. And so the creepypasta is told from a story of a guy who claims to have seen it when it originally aired. Um, it turned not to be to be to be fake <laughs> it's just like a really creepy drug trip surreal version of like spongebob and it's just supposed to be like a scary thing but you know it's fake or whatever and with that we are going from the kind of known lair to it is getting weirder down here the grifter the grifter is an alleged video that was first mentioned somewhere on 4chan's x image board watching it is said to be a soul rendering experience far more horrible than anything one could imagine the few that have watched it are said to have have been killed in their own homes with only one thing in common, a strange doll hidden somewhere in their homes. There's a message by the end of the video in the constructed international auxiliary language Esperanto that says, this child, now a young man, is still alive and lives in a local shelter whose name was not given. Oh, uh, it's just like a, it's like a, it's like a cursed video, haunted video, kills you if you watch it, blah, 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 blah. It's the same bullcrap. Uh, this is like an older one though, so I guess it was influential you could say maybe but um yeah the gif this is pretty much the exact same thing <laughs> i mean it's just like a gif that like turns scary it's a gif of like a smiley face right but it has like realistic 
eyes and realistic mouth, and then eventually it starts screaming at you, um, loud enough to burst your eardrums, apparently, which is to totally impossible with computers, or but whatever, man. Um, yeah, that's, that's the GIF. Krasaki Station. Okay, this is some stuff that I love, bro. We're getting, okay, we're getting from two boring ones to a really cool one. This one is awesome. So this one also originated on the 2CH message board, and this one originated in 2004. This one is a story about a girl, I think it's a girl, named Hasumi waking up in a train carriage with every other passenger asleep. Now, the story I'm pretty sure is told as if she was just like sharing her story, like just like talking to people on the message board. Now on this train, the conductor and the driver were both extremely inaccessible, so she was kind of stuck. And then after an unexpectedly long trip of a whole hour, the train stopped at Kizaragi Station late in the night. And this place was completely vacant and there was like nothing going on. It was a ghost town. Now Hasumi was adamant to leave the train, but she was kind of scared, you know, because she was told from people on the forum that there's no station listed online called uh, Kizaragi Station. She wandered around, tried to find a taxi, couldn't find anything. Then eventually she found a telephone booth, she called her parents and requested that they come get her, but even her parents could not find where she was because Kizaragi Station was on none of the actual maps. And then she was told to call the police, but they wouldn't believe her, they thought that she was just like joking. So she just walked around pretty much, but then eventually found someone, a one-legged man who completely vanished. But then blah blah blah, she kept walking through like a tunnel, like a train tunnel, and when she reached the end, she was welcomed by a friendly man who offered a ride to safety. But this was kind of unusual and weird because it was like a middle of nowhere, you know, and like late at night. But she didn't really have an option other than that, so she just accepted and got into the train with the man. And then this was her last post. My battery's almost run out. Things are getting strange, so I think I'm gonna make a run for it. He's been talking to himself about bizarre things for a while now. To prepare for the right time, I'm gonna make this my last post for now. And that was the last they ever heard from her. Satan's Sphinx. This is another cursed video creepypasta. It's the same thing as the Grifter, pretty much. There are some versions of it that's been found. It's, it's just like, oh, is this a scary video? The, the, you curses you if you watch it. And the whole video is just like a bunch of like random scary pictures just like smashed together into this one like like TikTok level of like fast um, pacedness. But this one isn't even really worth covering. Um, I watched the Some Ordinary Gamers video on it and researched it a little bit, but even his whole video is just saying this is stupid. So I'm not really gonna go into it. Michigan Blue Hell. This one is another awesome one. So if you don't know what Blue Hell is, it's a video game term, right? Where you know like in Gary's Mod or other games like that, if you no clip out of the world, you can kind of see, like if you like underground, right? You can like see all the other rooms and stuff, but from the outside, like to where you only see the rooms you can actually go inside of. So it looks, it looks like this. I'll, I'll just have my editor put a picture up or a video or something so you can see what it, like a blue hell looks like in video games. Now people purport that Michigan has this because Michigan has so many like tunnels under it, right? So people imagine that Michigan has like a blue hell <laughs> that if you like go in the tunnels, go in the right tunnels for like long enough, you go pretty much this blue hell. For people, some people theorize that it's not even like a real place. Like if, if you go these tunnels, you can like go to a different dimension or something. This is really cool though. Like the reach it has is unique. It's pretty fun. You know, I like it. Solar Plexus Clown Glider. Solar Plexus Clown Glider is the collective name given to a broad range of paranormal phenomena attributed to a corruptive entity which infects weak and vulnerable people through the solar plexus chakra. Originally used by 80s New Age practitioners, the phenomena was linked to a horror-themed email forwardable in the late 90s, which claimed that simple reading or hearing the words solar plexus clown glider made one susceptible to infection. Others claim that one became infected through viewing a set of spooky black and white images circulating online. I'm just gonna leave it at that. I just read it from the wiki a little bit, but you get the idea. Came EO. This one is so, dude, I swear, bro. I, yesterday, I, I did my research usually like a day before I record, right? Yesterday I was recording this. I was trying to find what the hell Came EO was. I do not know. Okay, this is what the wiki says, okay? The name was likely first coined in 2011, 2012 when the notorious Deep Web Levels infographic was created. A 2016 4chan anonymous user claims to have found a screenshot of the service in 2013. The poster claims the screenshot itself was taken from 2011. Dude, I have no idea what the hell this thing is even about. Anybody, please tell me. Please, please, please tell me. I don't know what this is, dude. I'm, I'm making, it's making me go crazy, man. It's like an AI thing that's like supposed to like track you, but it's like scary. It's like an AI that Google uses or some, 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 something, man. I don't even know, dude. And with that, we are going from, it is getting weirder down here to the final lair. You have been a scientist. Ohio 
Joe's email urban legends. So this is from a website called ghostsofohio.org. It reads, recently two urban legends in particular have begun circulating around the internet that name Ohio as the locale. Stranger still is that while the vast majority of urban legend emails are comprised of text only, both of these come complete with a photo. So the first one is about a photo of a car accident that the photograph in it has a figure and like the officer who took it was trying to find out what was going on, trying to fix it, but he realized that it that was like real. That was actually like a real thing. He put tests on the picture and it came back real. So basically saying that this was like an angel or something. The next one is called the zombie girl and it's kind of similar. So this one is just a photo that has been sent around and it's been connected with a bunch of Ohio locations like the Gore Orphanage and stuff, but it's kind of hard to follow. Um, the actual story is kind of unknown at this point. It's kind of like lost media, but it's pretty cool, dude. It's pretty scary. Also, I'm me. I'm poor. You know me. So I got to make some Ohio guy hit. Um, Riz, skibbity toilet, Ohio, Ohio Riz. Ha ha ha. Jokes. <laughs> <laughs> one million viewer. So this one is another creepypasta story. The narrator, seeking to increase their online viewership, is intrigued by an email suggesting that they link their account to this website called 1million.icu. Upon visiting, the narrator encounters a strange interface featuring a glowing cat-like eye, and the entity identifies itself as one of a million. This entity claims that it can bring the narrator a million viewers in exchange for their email address. After submitting their email, the narrator's first video garners an unexpectedly high number of views, along with numerous peculiar comments focusing on their eyes. The site seems to have fulfilled its promise, but in a disturbing way. Now returning to the site, the narrator finds multiple eyes on the screen, all fixated on them. The story takes a darker turn as the narrator begins experiencing nightmares filled with countless eyes and a feeling of being strangled. These dreams hint at a sinister presence linked to the website. The original sender of the email then contacts the narrator again, expressing regret and revealing they had to sacrifice people to the entity to delay their own demise. The sender urges the narrator to continue passing on the link to delay the entity, implying that it is a relentless, malevolent force. This one's pretty cool. It's like the chain email thing, but it's kind of taken more seriously and kind of slower, I guess, you know? So it's not as cringy, you know? Urkhammer, Iowa. This one is a creepypasta about a town that seemed to have disappeared in the 1920s. So the story goes that this guy was traveling through Iowa and he had to make a stop for some fuel. He gets his fuel, he drives on, but then it immediately goes back to empty already. So he decides to drive back because the town is still kind of like visible from where he is. He keeps driving, he keeps driving, he keeps driving, but the town never gets any closer. He gets a ride from somebody else to somewhere else, and then he learns that nobody has ever heard of the town called Urkhammer. It's like it never existed. This was really interesting. I, I love this. this this kind of stuff. These stories, these stories always get to me. <laughs> and that is it for this Internet Urban Legends Iceberg. I really hope you guys enjoyed this one. This one was super fun to make. This one took so much work and time and research, but I really, really hope you guys enjoyed it. So, uh, yeah. Everybody, please sleep well. Sweet dreams.